Um, all right. So, uh, the real cost of security. Uh, first, a little, a little bit about the 451 group, and I am in 451 Research, which is one branch of the 451 group. We do a lot of stuff, including uh, we have our Uptime Institute that um, does tier certification for physical data centers. We acquired Yankee Group, who you probably heard of, um, either this year or last year, I'm trying to remember. They cover mostly mobility these days, and underneath 451 Research, we cover pretty much everything else in what we call the digital infrastructure, you know, from power all the way up to layer eight, or layer nine, maybe. So I wrote a paper. This is a long paper. Um, what I did was I polled a bunch of security uh, professionals, people we know and love in the community, and I had this question to ask them. I'm a new CISO in a 1,000 person enterprise that has never done security before. I have a blank check. Now I know this never happens in real life, but I wanted to get rid of the financial considerations. And I'm asking you as a consultant to tell me what to buy. And you would not believe the range of reactions that I got just to this question. I got a lot of suspicion. <laughs> Uh, one person said, oh, this would never happen. That's a ridiculous situation. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what happened to me when I started at the Texas Education Agency on my first day. I was the only security person, and they said, we need your budget request by the end of business today. <laughs> so it really does happen. And I, I still have people calling me, consultants who say, I'm working with a new client. They've never done security. i got to make a list for them of what they need to buy so they can budget for it. Tell me, you know, can you help me make a list? So this really does happen, and it happens all the time. One of my favorite reactions was this one. I hate this survey because it assumes that everyone and everything is the same, and it asks me for an exhaustive list I can't possibly provide, and I will, of course, forget three quarters of what I always talk about, and there's no way I can answer it. This was from none other than somebody we know and love, Nick Selby who was actually the very first uh, research director of the enterprise security practice at 451. He was the one who convinced me to become an analyst. But he's a cranky guy, as you can tell, and, and he doesn't hold back. But you have to sort of ask yourself, why was he so annoyed? I sent him this in writing. You know, it, he, did he not have Google? You know, why was this so hard? I was not on stage with him holding a taser to his butt and saying, you have to make a list right now. Why did this annoy him so much? Why is this so hard? Uh, here's another reaction that I got. Um, now, I, I got all sorts of, of things. There were some people who suggested buying as few as four different technologies. And one person recommended as many as 31 separate technologies. Now, you can tell that this person was from a really rich organization, and they could afford to buy one of everything. And they often did. Everybody's response reflected their experience, where they worked, what they were used to. So this one said, before I bought anything, I would invest in a BSA and, and engage a security management program for at least a year. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, we'll have a program going, and we still don't have any firewalls up for a year. How is this supposed to work? Uh, but it turned out this, this person is actually somebody who sells these sort of services. So that's the lens that they were looking at. And so I thought, well, you know, it, it takes all, all kinds. There was, one, um, there was one person who responded and said, in our organization, we have as many as 50 different technologies, but we really only make use of four of them. So you can imagine just how disparate this is. It, you know, we know in, in the military and financial services, they can afford to buy one of everything, and they usually do. Um, in fact, if, if I had a dollar for every vendor that said that BOA had, was a customer, Bank of America, I, I could stop doing this for a living. Bank of America buys everything, or they're apparently a large financial institution that everybody talks about, the one that has you know, tried some of their stuff. So it, it's a huge, huge range. So let's talk about what people did answer. And I want to emphasize that I did not prompt anybody. This, this was not multiple choice. This was a completely open question. And because I, I wanted to see what people would say, what they would write down, what they would call it, 
in what order, you know, some, some of them prioritized them, some didn't, some did a, you know, stream of consciousness sort of list. Um, but this is, these are the ones that came out the most often out of people. Uh, the blue are the total, the total people who listed that technology in some form or another. And when I asked them what would be a total minimum, what would be a, a, a you know, bare minimum out of what they listed, this is the green. So as you can see, despite everybody saying that AV and firewalls don't work very well, everybody listed AV and firewalls. Those were the most commonly listed technologies. And why is this? It's because you cannot not recommend AV and firewalls. You can't say, oh, no, you don't need them. Leave them out. Nobody does that. If somebody does that, come see me after class, because I would love to talk with you about it. Um, IDS and IPS, now you can see there's some divergence here between them listing it and saying that it's absolutely necessary. So IDS, IPS, kind of, not everybody felt it was really necessary. Um, general type monitoring, about half and half. Encryption, the same in SIM. Now, if you take a look at these, does this remind you of anything? Exactly so. Hey, Lenny, on the last slide, yeah. monitoring, it said general, right? So yeah. can you give some examples of what maybe they responded as monitoring? Yeah, sometimes they just said the word monitoring, some kind of monitoring. Um, sometimes they were a little more specific and they said application monitoring or they said network monitoring. Um, basically, anything that did not have to do with um, collecting logs or they didn't say the word SIM. But they, but they said the word monitoring in some form or fashion. I counted that as monitoring. Um, no compliance or, or compliance as in uh, policy-based, uh, tripwire can do, but policy-based not file integrity, um, you know, enforce the CIS or, or obviously FISMA stuff. That yeah. they, they weren't terribly specific, specific. You know, they didn't write out all the different kinds of monitoring. Most of the time, they just said some sort of monitoring or real-time monitoring, or uh, you know, we would have a sock and we would do some monitoring. Th this was the sort of thing that they talked about. No product specific at all. Um, if they usually they didn't specify products. If they did, I left them out because I did not want this to be about vendors, um, just about general technologies. The other problem is, and maybe you've noticed this, that a lot of a lot of the terms that we were talking about are going away, or at least the new crop of vendors that I talk to most often are running away from a lot of these terms. They're saying, yes, we're big data analytics, we look at security events, but we're not a SIM. Or they say, oh, we're, we're not signature-based an antivirus, which is kind of a straw man, because nobody uses just signatures anymore. Um, they say, you know, we, we detect uh, you know, advanced persistent threats. And when I ask, well, how is that not IDS and IPS, they go, oh, well, that's not, it's not. Um, yeah, uh, Kevin Mandia gets really annoyed when I ask why his indicators of compromise are not signatures. Um, he, he says, well, you know, thousands of factors go into it. And I say, okay, it's a really big signature. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that all of these terms are actually starting to go away and, and vendors are distancing themselves from them. So depending on what people recommend, they may not be using the same words anymore. The other thing that we've discovered, we also have a service inside of 451 Research that interviews IT executives for an hour or more about what they're buying and why. And this is another case where we don't prompt them. We ask them, what are you using for application security? And if they say SharePoint, we write it down. And what, we, and what we've found is that there are most of the users out there do not understand the jargon that we use in security. They are completely confused. Even inside of security, people are confused about the difference between a web application firewall and an application aware firewall. And uh, so there's so much nebulous stuff going on. I don't want to say cloudy, uh, but that, you know, we don't even know what we're talking about half the time. So having said that, this is what I was able to distill out of the answers that I got. And yes, it does look an awful lot like PCI. And the thing is that you know PCI is really not that bad of a standard if you are simply trying to start with something and you need a list. It's a great list. It's a list. 
when you thought of asking the question of that uh, qualification, um, I think Ian and I did a presentation and you did this and saw one or applied to them. Yeah. Oh my God, it's really identical. What's the prevention of that list and then what's the detection in that list? Yeah. And then what percentage of budget do you spend on each? And right now, I know the only two presentations I've seen Tina and I are part of Black Moon, where we're almost reversed, our opinions are completely reversed. But yeah, we're the only ones successfully protecting each other. So that's good. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And in fact, I, I really hate when people say, oh, you should be spending more on detection than prevention because. If I'm a CISO and I've started with a budget that I've had for a couple of years and I've had this much on these products and you know I'm going to keep them in-house and they're all prevention, am I supposed to cut down my spending and maybe use fewer products in order to have money to spend on, on detection? Or should I just be going back to you know, my boss and saying, I need more money now for detection? You know, what, is that, what does spending more on detection than prevention mean? Um, well, we are detector. I mean, we, yeah. we have to change the way our, our, our lines have been on these prevention devices. You know, the bad guys are so incredibly good that some of the products just aren't working well. We pick a handy, yeah. great, great example. Yeah. But there are a lot of solutions that are losing their effectiveness for cost benefit, almost an ROI. How much am I really benefiting now from these yeah. tools? They were great five, six, seven, eight years ago. I got a lot of benefit out of it, but now they've just so gone by. Somebody had quoted in a presentation, uh, bypass that will, bypass carbon black yeah. And I would say bypass detection at will, bypass prevention at will, they're absolutely masters. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get to more of that. Um, so yes, everybody's scared of PCI, but really it was a pretty good start considering the other answers that I got. Here are the next six most frequently listed ones, and you'll probably agree with all of them. Notice that application security was the next most, um, but it was only recommended about half the time as much as the other ones on the other slide. And this was from, again, from security professionals. Why would they not list application security as an absolute must? So, you know, some of them said, yes, it would be good to have, but it's not a, it's not a, a bare minimum. But you asked for products, and why about application security? OWASP is not a product. Yeah, there you go. No, I, I asked for technologies, not products. Um, but there were people who did not say anything about application security. Again, these people that I interviewed had at least 10 years of security under their belts. There are a lot of people that we know and respect in the community. If they forgot to talk about application security, where does this leave us? Especially for people who don't know what they're supposed to buy. Uh, web security, uh, this is more along the lines of web filtering. Um, stopping people from going to bad sites. Uh, DLP was just about, nobody thinks DLP is necessary. They listed it, but they said no, this is not this is not really necessary. Um, application firewall of some kind, XML firewall, WAF, um, it, you know, anything else. Identity and access management. These were all the ones that were next most frequently listed. And then I asked people, well, how many people do you think it would take to run this? And again, this is, is for a 1,000-person organization, because I had to do some scoping around it. And again, a lot of people said, well, I can't tell you what to buy until you tell me more about the organization. But I said, well, try anyway. You know, tell, tell me something. Give me something. And so you know, one person said, you know, hire one person and give them a whole bunch of open source software. Um, yeah, I feel really sorry for that person. <laughs> really, really sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But remember, when I when I started in my job, I was the one person. Although to be fair, we did have people who were doing firewally stuff, um, you know, outside of security. Um, somebody said I could easily overwork twelve people, and again, this is at a, at a um, at a one thousand person organization. Now, strangely enough, five years later, when I left TEA. I had 10 direct reports, and I had another team of eight that was working on an IAM project for me. So this is kind of, you know, growing up to where you, you kind of feel like you're getting a handle on stuff. Um, one person decided to say that it would be, you took like, I don't know, 20, 15 or 20 percent of, um, you know, the number of employees, and that would be the number of security people you should have, and they ended up with 30. We thought, no, that was ridiculous. 
So again, this is very much dependent on what your experience is and what you plan to do, what you think you can do, and what you can afford. Here's everything else that was listed in some, in some form or fashion at least once, maybe not more than once. Um, you know, some of this stuff is, is very you know, new or fancy stuff, that, and usually the people who listed more technologies got around to listing these. Nobody likes Mac. Almost nobody likes Mac. Although we are seeing a resurgence of it, um, especially being driven by uh, BYOD. And then I asked them, where did you get this list from? What, where did you derive this from? Based on what? And most of them said experience. Some of them did say NIST, PCI, you know, SANS, but just about everybody, the majority, just said experience. They just kind of know. It's just conventional wisdom. So the people on the right side are denying. Well, you know, who knows? You know, it's if you are a seasoned professional, you go, well, I, I just know that everybody needs, you know, prevention technologies, and you need some sort of detection. You need to manage configurations across your enterprise. Um, you know, you can come up with a basic one, but it's just what you've already seen working, what you've already used. Um, we don't have any hard evidence to show whether any of those things actually works. It's very much, you know, shamanistic. This is our, this is our feeling. This is our conventional wisdom. This is what everybody says you ought to have, and yeah, I can see how it makes sense, so I'm going to list it too. Um, it's just so, some sort of magic incantation that we list. And we do it from experience. Did you ask a confidence level of the technology? A competent, confidence? confidence? How confident are they that they really Oh, no, no, I didn't. And then I asked them what else would change their recommendation if they knew other things about the organization. And a lot of these make sense. The type of business, everybody said type of business. Um, regulatory requirements was another really big one. But again, that's compliance, that's not for effective security. But it's another threat that they have to manage to, the threat of the auditor versus you know, the threat of the hacker. Um, the budget and revenue, a lot of people were very pragmatic. It depends on how much money you have. That's how much security you buy. You know, and, and sadly, this is, this is what happens. Um, and data type and classification, only a few people actually mentioned that, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, it doesn't really matter what type of data you have. It matters you know, more what the regulator is going to say to you, what they say that you, you need to have. Yeah, geographic location, um, dispersion, for example. Mm, yeah, go, go tell that to the people in Singapore. They're also very cranky in Singapore. They tend to take over your servers once you put them there. Um, so, you know, geographically dispersed, you know, when you have um, a lot of branch offices, franchises, you know, all of that obviously will affect what you recommend for security. But the question is by how much? Um, you know, isn't something across the board, if everybody needs to, to look at their logs, shouldn't we be able to, you know, say across the board, everybody needs log management? Isn't that something that we should be able to say? So then I, I took the, the most commonly mentioned ones and I went to vendors and I asked how much would it cost for me to buy this for, for a 1,000 person enterprise? And I got the same reaction. We can't possibly tell you how much this costs until you tell us more about the, the enterprise. And now notice I did not go to companies and say what did you pay for this? Because a lot of times they work out discounts, or, you know, there are all sorts of factors that go into how much they actually ended up paying for it that would have just muddied the waters. So I went to the vendors and said, you know, I want to buy this today. How much is this going to cost me? And I would say, I would, sometimes I would call, you know, openly and say, you know, I'm an analyst. I'm looking for this. Uh, sometimes I would say, you know, I would, I would chat with their, um, with their representative online and I would pretend to be a, a person who's trying to make out a budget. And, you know, so I got these answers. So I didn't, a lot of them would not give me answers. And so I did what I could with the data. But you can see the variation in here. The low, 113.3. The high is $475,000 if you spent the top uh, end of whatever I was able to price. 
And then I took the average. If you think I should have done the median, see me after class, I, I don't even know. What's, what significance doing an average as opposed to a median as opposed to any other slice of this data? But if you have a good idea, you know, I'm all ears. There's no way those accurate. I mean, the average is probably the low and the high is probably the low. Well, it depends. I talk to MSSPs. I talk to box vendors. I talk to vendors who sold these things as a SaaS. And actually, all of the prices were pretty much the same across the board. Those vendors all pay attention to each other and the prices. They know who they're competing against, and they try to, to get parity with their pricing. Well, the like, management is much more stable. Like the high and half the high is mm -hmm. Yeah, can you talk about that quarter million dollar for configuration management. Yeah, well, it depends on what you what you classify as configuration management, and an enterprise license with you know GRC and bells and whistles, and you know you're configuring your whole enterprise. I forget which product that was, but I wouldn't say which vendor it was anyway. But you know of these you know huge monolithic sort of things that you get from a large vendor, and you get an enterprise license, and it's you know half a million dollars. We've all seen those. The other uh, interesting thing about this is the firewall, low and high average of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a yeah. firewall, it's not you know. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That was one where I was not able to get um, <laughs> prices out of a lot of vendors. In some cases, I had, where the, the technology is very commoditized, they often already have the price up on their website. So it was easy, I could just go to that. So if it's more commoditized, they will tell you the price. If it isn't, they keep it a well-guarded secret. And so even the ones that I got here, I had to aggregate. I could not, I cannot tell you about individual vendors because I promised I wouldn't. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is that if you hired one person, and again, I took a sample, I think I took the average salary from a survey that somebody had done of you know uh, security professionals. I think it was like 90, $92,000 a year and added all the HR costs onto it. If you hired one person and all open source software, this is how much you would have to budget for this 1,000 person enterprise. If you did more of a, you know, a middle of the road thing or the highest plus a staff of four, not even the 12, but a staff of four, that's almost $1.5 million. All of this means that if you're the, the poor CISO who's sitting there with an Excel spreadsheet and you're trying to budget for what you need for security, you could be off by as much as a factor of four or five. And that's pretty scary. <laughs> so it, it, it is really, really scary. And the question is, how much of this is going to be affordable for an SMB of 1,000 people. You know, I don't know if you consider a 1,000 employee enterprise to be small, medium, it depends on who you talk to. But can they afford 1.5 million? Can they afford 225,000? It really depends. The, the day when I came into TEA and they said, we need your budget by the end of the day, I think I, I put in like a $2,000 budget. I, I asked for a logging server and a couple of books. And the person I was reporting to scribbled it all out and said, where do you think you are, the private sector? Uh, and so I had a budget of zero when I started. And I know that there are other, uh, I had a, have had other colleagues in this city who have started out with zero budget and often stayed that way for a couple of years. So $225,000, I would have been laughed out of the agency if I had started with that. But that's what, you know, that's what it would have cost. So the thing is that you may hate PCI, but at least it is a very concrete, very prescriptive list of technologies. It tells you when you're done. And as a result, we're seeing that used as shorthand for other areas. For example, MSSPs tell us that they are getting requests for PCI type bundles from their customers because their customers don't know what to ask for. And they say, you know, even if they don't have to comply with it, they say, well, this looks pretty good. This is a good list. It's got reporting. Sure, we'll take that. So this is how PCI is becoming shorthand for a, a required level of security. And so that really ought to scare you because we all know this is not enough. 
but it's the only thing we have. So if we're going to make this better, what are we supposed to do with this? How are we going to make it better? Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know. This is something where we, we need to come together as an industry and figure this out. Um, open source plus staff might work, and in some cases it's actually cheaper. Uh, in South America, for example, they have a, a big services economy, so that services are very, very cheap. They're a lot cheaper than products. So there's a lot more open source use there with a lot more consultants behind it. We have the opposite thing here. Um, talent is very expensive. It's very hard to get. It's hard to tell when you've gotten it. If you, you know, if you have somebody in front of you that you're interviewing, what are you going to do? Are you going to ask them for their CISSP? How are you going to tell that you are hiring the right security talent? Even as a security person, I know, I know when I talk to somebody, I know, you know, wh who, what I have and, and who I'm talking to, but somebody who is in a small enterprise and knows nothing about security is not going to know this. They're going to go for the CISSP because they've heard that, you know, this is the easiest thing uh, to ask for. Um, so, you know, this, this could be too expensive. Even the open source thing could be too expensive. I, I can't see one person trying to run all seven technologies that somebody would need as a bare minimum. I just can't see it. Um, so, you know, two, three, four people, you know, running it or maybe doing it, time slicing it. You know, you have a half an FTE here and a half an FTE here, which is really good for reading logs because you, you, I love it when somebody who has five other jobs has to take time to try to read logs. It's never going to happen. So, you know, you need a certain amount of dedicated mind share to be able to focus on security. If you don't have it, are, are these technologies going to do you any good if you can't use them properly? Um, so will MSSP save us? Maybe. Maybe, and, and there are MSSPs that specialize in smaller enterprises um, where they just say, you know, we don't know what to do. We don't know what we need. We're just going to hand this over to you and tell us if we need to do something. Give us a call if, if we're owned. It, you know, a, a lot of them end up having to do that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. The, yeah. It, it, and it, again, it depends. I've talked with smaller MSSPs who are cheaper. And it depends on what si type of services you get. Um, these things do not come automatically you know, with a, with a SaaS, but it may be that it will be easier for these smaller companies just to you know, move everything over to an, a secure email provider, for example, rather than trying to get somebody who understands how to secure email in their environment. A lot of people do this. And I, I believe that we're, and we're actually seeing this, that most of the migration to the cloud is based on very granular, very well understood non-core business functions, like email. There isn't too much variance in email anymore. You know exactly what you're going to get. You know what kind of security you need around it. Most of it having to do with not getting viruses and spam. So a lot of people have moved, you know, happily moved their stuff to the cloud. Gmail's right there. Um, HR is moving to the cloud, accounting. If you count ADP, you know, we've had business process outsourcing on that for decades. Um, we're seeing some, uh, a lot of uh, customer relationship management. Salesforce.com is huge. It's getting huger by the day. Again, it's well understood. You don't need a lot of variation. People, it's, you know, people have tried to write their own, but it's really bad idea. They don't need to. It's easy for them to move over to Salesforce. So I think that's going, how we're going to see these things. And hopefully, with a SaaS, they have a pretty solid security set in, in the stack already, hopefully. I know that's not a given. But most of the high-end um, end users that I talk to generally feel that if, they're, if it's a SaaS, they generally have a pretty good security model all the way down. That's what they're telling me. That's what they feel. Um, I, I don't know, uh, our snake left. I was going to ask him how, how many of these he's tested um, to find out how many SaaS providers are really secure. But that could, be, that could be the only way to go instead of them trying to secure what they currently have. I know for a lot of times when we've looked, you know, so as a bigger company, right, you can go and talk to the SaaS providers and try to get them to provide some evidence. Yeah. And there's been several times when you look under the covers of the SaaS companies where the back end is pretty horrible. Um, 
and like where they couldn't, they can't even tell you anything. It's not that they, they it's, that it's a bad structure. It's literally they have no idea what's going on or how anything works. Yeah. Um, so they're just like, well, take it or leave it. Salesforce. <laughs> I'm not back on Salesforce, but I don't do it. But there are several that we've seen where it's like, you, some are great, right? Look at the covers this great, and some are terrible. But if you're small enough that you can't do it yourself, like you can't. One, they're not going to do the information you're asking for, and two, you can't evaluate it. Exactly, you can't evaluate it. And you can't fix what you have because generally, if you are a smaller enterprise and you have very few IT resources, you've got a whole lot of dynamics going on there so that even lowering the price on something is not going to help you. You know, you're, you're going to have antiquated legacy equipment. It's going to be run by your CEO's cousin, Bob, um, or it's run by a third party and you have no control over it, where they say, oh, we'll fix it if you pay us. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they just simply cannot do. Um, you know, examples of if you only have a few servers, you're going to pile everything onto them until they can't run anymore. And this is exactly opposite to segregation of duties uh, or network segmentation or anything. So maybe MSSPs is the way if we can work out a model that's sustainable and affordable and vetted that, you know, actually works. Or we move everybody to SaaS, things that have, again, that have been vetted um, sufficiently. I don't know, uh, but this is a good thing for us to be talking about, I think. So talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to have a moment. Any other great uh, suggestions, comments? comments? I didn't see anything about patching. Yeah. You're right. I actually did put that. Yeah, I put that into configuration management. I thought about leaving it separate, but then I then I threw it together because data. Okay. I, 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 I completely agree with your findings. Don't get me wrong. Our industry is doing that, and it's, I'm here to tell you it's completely wrong. I could probably do all that with the free technology. Well, you can, okay, you can do the next talk <laughs> on how you would do it because the, that's the other thing. We don't have anybody brave enough to, to get up on stage and say, this is what works. Because yeah, it's like going pull. Yeah, we can, you know, I'm sorry, right here. You've know, you got to have a firewall, you've got to have access controls. You need a product like they fix, you need a log period. Anything else that's, return on this is so small that you, your biggest gain from ABT on a security guy is going to be your cost of the network. Yeah. 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 Y
but they know what we know. They know how we do it because they used to be us or, or are us at the same time. And so even though this technology is really good, you know, we have to exploit these tools and really understand, okay, you can't do this and here's why. Oh, this really isn't practical, there isn't why. And also these were designed way back when we were a lot smaller. We didn't use them everywhere. And now we're using these, talk, these tools everywhere, and we really exceeded it. Really like it. So less tools, really exploit what they can do, really expand upon what they do, spend all your effort there, and be really good at it. You'll have so few goals of time. So are you saying that you're not, you're not getting them to help? What you're doing now works. Okay, so here's another premise. So even I believe <laughs> the end point, the end point is completely volatile. You cannot protect the end point. Forget it. Can't do it. Windows is fundamentally broken. I don't care how much you lock it down, I don't care what you do to it, you're on the internet, it'll get home. Your users search the internet, there's too many apps, there's too many other days, you know, struts, pick one, Adobe, anything, Java, everything. You just you can't protect against that. You just can't. So the reality is your endpoint's gonna get popped. And the reality is if you take that concept and say, I'm gonna let that happen, but I'm going to immediately react upon that occurring, then from that aspect, no, we are not on. Do okay. the endpoints get popped and kind of detect it? Yes. The okay. 210 days for us is maybe 210 seconds or 210 Okay. Minutes. So you're saying this, this, this model works for you for responding to every security threat. Will it work for, you know, one, can you prove it? And yes, two, sir. can it work for anybody else? Yes, yes, sir. Is this a reference architecture that we can sell to everybody else and say, this is what's going to work? You can go by Swamp or pick your log management solution you can really exploit. You can go by Big Fix or Tanium and really exploit it, yes. So I think there's also a bias in the language that you asked the question on too, because you said, what do you need to create a security shop? So or, or what was the exact language of the, the question? I just said they've never done security before. Yeah. I'm asking you to tell me what to buy. OK, so do security. Like, I mean, I could get firewalls and do these things, and I say, hey, I've got a security shop. I'm doing security. Yeah, it doesn't mean if my organization is Well, safe. remember, these were all security pros. Right. Would, ten, would any of them stop short? So, I mean, if, 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 the, if the goal was how can I make the most secure shop, it's like, okay, I'll spend no money and my company won't be connected to the internet. Love it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But that's not, not, cutters, that's, that's not what we're actually trying to say. We're trying to say, like, how much money do I need to spend to make sure my company is PCI compliant? No. How, how much is spend? enough security? I didn't even qualify what, what the end goal was or you know any of the criteria. I, I wanted them to list things until they stopped, until they felt it was enough. And you know these, again, these are people we all know and love who are you know very well respected in the community, uh, a lot of them. So th this is the problem. And you know, Michael, with all due respect, I think if, the, if it were that easy, everybody would be doing it by now. I don't think there's anyone reference architecture. Uh -huh. We are very, you know, yeah. look at the talent that's behind the products that we talked about. You've got to have staff that can understand A, what they're doing in the box, and B, how to exploit these solutions. You can't take a security administrator who just says, I do tripwire, and expect that talent to be able to do what I just said. You've got to have talent. There's no doubt about it. So maybe that's the you need talent, and it's been at least my experience that. For any given security problem, let's say detection, that you have in an enterprise, part of it is the problem itself. You will have the same problem no matter, you know, it's a, the theoretical part of the problem. A much bigger portion of it is the environment in which you're having that problem. Because there's so many constraints on what you're having to do, what technology you're trying to do this with, what technology you have, the political climate, the people, the culture. Um, you know, whether things are outsourced and in your, un, not under your control. All these sort of things contribute to the context of the problem. And then there's a small portion that's, you know, maybe you're just not doing it right. Thank you. Thank you.